Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new podcast. My name is JJ Vola. Alongside here is my cousin, Cal. Today, we have a special yeah. guest, Eric Johnston, which is a comedian. Thank you so much, Eric, for being a part of today's podcast. I didn't know you guys were cousins, but now you say that, <laughs> yeah. I for sure know you guys are cousins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We don't like, like to get the too same, much backstory. Same <laughs> smile, same nod. Sure, I was like, oh, sure. these guys are related. <laughs> yeah. We're probably the, actually the only most similar in our family. Uh, yeah, I, I can see that now. <laughs> like a, a, a piece of double mint gum. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> both got the ADHD. <laughs> Yeah, you know, a million ideas. Same all sweatshirts. Kind of I get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I'm, I'm, my face is gonna hurt, buddy. <laughs> We're already rolling. I'm worried. You haven't I'm even asked me a question. Sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, tell us what you do, Eric. Oh uh, well, I'm an accountant. Uh, no, uh, no, I'm a stand-up comic. I've been a comic for almost 13 years across North America. I'm also an actor, professional MC, uh, writer. I'm writing a book now, so you can wow. put an author on that. Uh, Mm-hmm. But that's it. I would just say I'm in show business. When anyone asks me, they go, well, I'm in show business. Sure, and then sure. they go, what kind of show business? And then I go, well, I'm a comedian. My, it's fun, so funny with my fiance. We go everywhere. She's very supportive of who I am. But like you, people don't often meet comedians. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. We were at the Jays game the other night. We we're up in that new Corona lounge. And uh, some guy, blah, 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 blah. So what do you do? What do you do? Yeah. And I go, I'm in show business. And then she's like, I can just see her going, here we go. And, <laughs> you know, I, well, I was like, oh, really? I've yeah. always wanted to get into comedy. And it's just all of it. Yeah. And he's answered the same six questions, which I'm sure I'll answer today. Uh, you yeah, know, how'd sure. you get into it? All that kind of stuff, which I'm happy to answer. But she's heard it so much. Right, so she's right. just like, I'm going to go get a beer. And yeah. I'm like, all right, come back in 10. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Let me, let me yeah. work this guy. I gotta sell him some tickets. Yeah, so. yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. It's so funny now. Cool. And obviously, we'll talk about the journey. Like, we'll talk about all the accomplishments that you've gone through, everything yeah. so far. But uh, tell us about the younger years. What it was? Uh, what was your first couple of jobs that you had? Like, we'll let, talk about how you led up to be a comedian. Uh, I mean, my first job ever was I worked at Winners as a, as a cashier, and then worked in the men's section as a stock boy, just stealing shit <laughs> every day. Okay. <laughs> just every day, I would purposely not wear a belt, then go into the belt section, put a belt on. Uh, I don't know why I'm telling you about my my theft, uh, but no, I, I, I punk teenager job, whatever. Sure. From that, my jobs after that was bartending. Uh, I was a great bartender because I was this guy, and I was you know making great money bartending. But it was you know long hours, like twelve hour shifts and stuff on my feet. And again, I was like twenty, so I didn't give a shit. I'm trying to. I was I used to bartend weddings and hmm. and all kinds of stuff. So I'm just picking up brides, trying to pick up bridesmaids and whatever. So it was a great job. <laughs> I just, my comedy career took off and I ultimately couldn't be a bartender anymore. But that was like my my own, only other real job was bartending. I worked at Good Life for like three months yeah. selling gym memberships, just telling people just to work out their arms and stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, we could see that. And then I have a real problem. Like I respect authority, but I have a, I have a real problem with like fake authority. Like the, like, cause you are the manager, you get to speak to me that way. Sure. And I, I mean, it makes sense why I'm a lone comedian, I'm like a cowboy just going like town to town and not taking any shit from anybody. <laughs> but sure. i remember there was a i was doing great so good life the guy i replaced he did not sell a membership for the first three months and i sold 14 in my first week wow. just because i knew how to talk to people i know how to be this guy and joke around like come on let me get you signed up sure. and you know it's 25 dollars by weekly but you get tanning and i'm just like whatever <laughs> yeah. jersey shore uh, very esque guy G10 um, laundry, you know. yeah yeah gtl maybe um <laughs> And I was great at the job. I was making great commission checks and whatever they're coming in. Sure. Um, but I remember I was le- I I was working at Ancaster in Wilson West, uh, location of of uh, Good Life, and and there was an accident on the right or something. I'm coming from Lower Stony Creek, and I was like, every day there was a meeting at eleven o'clock, and it was a sales meeting of like, who are your projection today? Who are you gonna call? Who are you gonna sell to? And I'd be like, I got this guy, this guy, this guy, whatever. And the the whole rule was if you were late for the meeting, they would lock the door. And you okay. weren't allowed to sit in the meeting. Wow. And that day, the meeting was happening in my office. And I like th- I, I ran in and I was like one minute late. Because I was never late because I knew they were going to lock the door. And I like, boom, and like, junk, junk. And I was like, motherfucker. And I like, and he opened the door sure. at the end of the meeting. And he's like, hey, you were late for your meeting. Can I talk to you in my office? I go, can I talk to you in my office? <laughs> yeah. like, Everybody cleared out. I go, what, the, what do you think you're doing? He's like, you know the rules. I go, I quit. He goes, no, no, no. You got. I go, I quit. I go, you can do that to me. Like I'm, I'm literally a salesman talking to the manager, GM, being like, you don't do that to me. Yeah. I quit. You're and fired. He, no, I quit. <laughs> and he's like, fine. He's like, you quit. He's like, you don't get your free membership anymore. I'm like, okay, we should talk. Uh, yeah. no, but I, ended up, <laughs> I ended up uh, quitting uh, immediately. So those are the only jobs I ever got. But I was always interested in, in show business and 
entertaining in my whole life. My dad was a professional wrestler. My grandfather was a professional wrestler. Oh, so cool. like, no you know, that was, I was grew up around the circus, so to speak. And sure, sure. so at a young age, I got into like dance, competitive dance, musical theater, theater, film and television. I was doing some, you know, bit parts and TV shows in uh, like Toronto. And then I auditioned for the Vancouver Film School, went out to Vancouver Film School in Vancouver. I signed up for my first uh, open mic ever on November 1st, 2010. And I literally have not stopped since. No uh, way. Yeah. Tell us about that experience. Like your first open mic for anyone that, you know, is like, man, I really want to do this or try it out or see what it's all about. Yeah. I think the biggest thing in comedy people, how do you get into it? Well, you just have to do it. You know, yeah. and it's like, well, one sec, I'm, I've been yelling a lot. Of days, so. <laughs> <laughs> and screaming at us. Yeah. Like, relax, relax. Yeah. Like, scaring the dog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, so I, I, I actually, pretty funny story too. Very Hamilton way of going about it. So Michael Moses, who's a touring headlining comedian himself now, him and I went to school together. He actually lived in my closet for a bit. Uh, every morning he came out of the closet. And um, <laughs> how corporate is this podcast? Yeah. He's going to loosen up. You got like a construction love, company sponsoring this thing? Yeah. You're like, oh, we're going to get canceled. Yeah, um, yeah, for sure. No, I had a one bedroom plus den in the, my apartment in Vancouver. And I let Mo Moses, if I call him Michael Moses. Yeah. He lived in my den, which is basically just room for a single bed. That's it. He just opened the door, single bed. He slept there. But wow. we became really close. And uh, he uh, signed up about a couple weeks before I did and started doing stand-up. And then he's like, you got to come watch this open mic comedy night. And it was at this place called Comedy at the Kingston, the Kingston Hotel in downtown Vancouver. And I walked in, and he was on the show. And I watched the show. And I was just, like, sitting there, and I was watching the show, and I was like, oh. I'm like, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Wow. Mm. I just, again, I hate the phrase, but for lack of a better phrase, it was an aha moment. Yeah. Uh, and you hear people say that on podcasts, it was my aha moment. Yeah, but it was yeah. quite literally like, wow, this right. is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Sure. I, at the end of the show, I went up to him now, who's now a friend of mine, his name is Simon King. I went up to him. I was like, man, I thought you were really funny. He was already headliner at that point himself. And I said, but who's running this thing? Who put this on? Who's the promoter? And uh, he goes, it's this guy over here. His name's Johnny Scoop. And I said, okay, cool. And I walked up to him and I said, hi, Johnny. My name's Eric Johnson. I'm a stand-up comic from Hamilton. I just moved here. I'm just looking for some stage time. I didn't premeditate this. I didn't think about this. I just knew this is what I need to do. And I just need to tell him that I'm already a comic and I need to get on stage. And he's like, okay, well, who have you worked with? What have you done? And I knew a bunch of stand-up comics already because I was an actor in Toronto and a lot of actors who do commercial work are also comics. So I met a bunch of them and I, I would name drop a bunch of them. I worked with this guy, I worked with this guy, I worked with this guy. He goes, oh yeah, it sounds like you've been around for a little bit. I go, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, okay, next Wednesday, come back. You can do seven minutes. So no it was literally that quick when I was like, oh, like this, my lie. He called, he called my bluff and he's like, okay, hey, come back next week. Okay. So I literally had seven days to prepare my first ever stand-up comedy routine. Now, um, it was okay. I had a little bit of an advantage because it was November 1st. So it was the day after Halloween. Mm. So I had a, I could just very easily write a bunch of Halloween jokes. And the very first joke I ever wrote, I still sometimes do near Halloween. Sure. And I'll do it for you now. Yeah, do it for us uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. The very first joke I ever wrote was, uh, I like I like Halloween. I go, I love Halloween. It's very interesting because all your girls are like, you know what? I am not a trashy girl. I'm not. I'm literally not. I, I'm not that way. I met some guy on Tinder. We hooked up in a parking lot, but I'm not that way. But then Halloween rolls around and all these same girls are like, I'm a slutty referee. Yeah. And <laughs> I'm ketchup. My boobs are out. You know, yeah. I'm mustard. My hats is out. <laughs> and I go, but every, every Halloween, nobody gets laid mm -hmm. because all the guys are way too drunk. Because all the guys don't drink like themselves. They drink like their costumes. They go, I can't drink a 26 or a rum. But a pirate can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And today I'm a pirate. It was the yeah. first joke I ever wrote, and it's actually not a bad bit. It's great. I still man. use it sometimes. Great, great. That, and I went so up on funny. stage, I did that, and I did some other Halloween stuff, and then I did something about hit being from Hamilton and whatever. And if I look back on the set, it's pretty awful. It's a pretty awful set. Sure. But the difference was is I had been doing musical theater and theater my entire life. Up right. to that point, I was not afraid to go on stage. Sure. Most sure. comics, the first five years of their career is just them trying to be comfortable on stage. Yeah. Where I had mm. been on stage since I was six years old. Okay. So I went up there and I like knew how to command the stage. I knew how to move the mic stand and whatever. So I looked like a 
seasoned comedian sure. and some of the material was off, but it's an open mic. Right. So he thought I was just a working comedian trying new stuff. Okay. So okay. it worked. And he went, you were really funny. He goes, come back next week. <laughs> wow. No way. Come back next week. That's and I've great. been coming back next week ever yeah. since then, 13 yeah. years later. Yeah. Since then, I've toured all over North America, performed at the Comedy Store in LA. I've opened for Russell Peters. I've no opened way. for Sebastian Maniscalco. Uh, I headlined at the House of Blues in Chicago. Cool. I uh, performed at the Laugh Factory, seven sold out shows at the Laugh Factory in Chicago. Jeez. I've been on like eight uh, sold out national headlining tours, maybe not eight, maybe five sold out national headlining tours. Montreal and back, New York City and back. I just sold out a show in New Jersey, which was huge for me because I'm a huge Sopranos fan. Sure. So, like, even just being in New Jersey, I was excited. Yeah. And then I get to the comedy club and they're like, he's like, you're sold out tonight. And I was like, no <laughs> yeah. way. Wow. And I went on stage and just like, wow. <laughs> uh, and it's just, yeah, it's still a struggle. It's still an uphill grind. I'm still literally battling with trying to become TikTok famous so I can become TikTok famous and live my lifelong dream of becoming a stand-up comic because you can't be a stand-up comic unless you're TikTok famous now. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm just like, you know, pumping out content and doing as much as I can. But it's been literally like, you know, it's been a 13-year uphill climb. Jesus, wow. man. And uh, yeah. So That's incredible. I love it. Yeah. What a, what That's a story. the story. That's, the story. <laughs> That's, That's a, a story, story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah. Are you sure there weren't any lies in there? Come on. Right, a couple. Just the one I told to Johnny Scoop. <laughs> Just the one I told you. That's so funny. We were just watching like one of your videos earlier, and I was just saying to JJ, I'm like, this guy reminds me of another guy. And I don't know how that, you know, yeah. you know, in, in comedy and whatnot, but uh, Sebastian Maniscalco. Yeah, yeah. I'm so like, I get that a lot. Yeah. Okay. I've opened for Sebastian. No way. Yeah. Okay. yeah cool. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I mean, no. you can see how that would work, but also not work. But anyway, sure, um, sure. I was always like a big animated guy, as you can see. Yeah. Uh, and also with my competitive dance background and musical theater. So everything was big and loud and <laughs> kicking and dancing. And my style was always that way. Sure. But when I first started, everyone thought I was trying to be like Dane Cook. Right. And okay. Dane Cook kind of fizzled out. Mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. Sebastian came in and everyone went, oh, you're trying to be like Sebastian. Sure. And I'm like, I'm not trying to be like anyone. I'm Eric Johnston. Sure. I'm just a high energy guy. Yeah. 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 And I will say that my, my stand up is still very high energy. I mean, you saw some of the clips. I'm kicking and dancing. <laughs> <sweat>. <laughs> you know, it, it's all facial expressions yeah. too, which is very Sebastian and Dane Cook like. Yeah. I just yeah. think if you're, if when you're a high energy comic, that people try to put you in that bracket, you know, that, oh, you're like that guy. Sure. It's like when someone's like, um, like a very dark and dirty they're like oh you're like jesselnick you know what i mean mm. and, and that's fine i mean yeah. sebastian's one of the most successful comics Incredible. of all time yeah. so when people are like you like sebastian i go thanks sure that's oh, a nice compliment you know and right. hopefully i become as big as sebastian yeah and, you know, working yeah. on it but uh working with him was great he was very humble and mm -hmm. and he thought i was italian i just let him think i was italian uh <laughs> and he's like you're italian right I go, yeah. Yeah. So I go do 10 minutes and i went okay and yeah. i went to 10 minutes no way seven sold out sold out theater 750 people and, uh, and this was right before he broke he just he had already done the first special and the special where he's wearing like the maroon sweatshirt was just about to come out and i opened for him then and then I opened for him, and then that special came out, and he became Smash. No way, yeah. Dude. So, and mm. he was doing comedy for fifteen years before he was successful. Sure, I um, say that often, and they say it takes fifteen years to make an overnight success, yeah. especially in stand-up comedy. Sure, so, yeah, sure. Yeah, True. I'm thirteen years in, and I'm enjoying every, uh, there we go, every man. step. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's incredible, dude. I love that. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what's what would you say is like the best part of your job, Eric? Uh, uh again, I. I the fact that I get to do it alone is is crazy. Like the, I've already done more than most comics will ever dream of, and I don't mean in a braggy way. I've worked for that. I've toured. I've I've showed up and done the work and whatever. I love to travel. I I, I truly do love it. Like my father, like I said, my grandfather and father were both traveling, touring professional wrestlers. Yeah, yeah. They were always in the car or in the van and whatever, and going to a new town. And those guys would put fifteen hour drives in and then wrestle a match. You know, it's like. I I love seeing I basically get to see the country and and most of all of North America for free because mm -hmm. I'm paid wow. to go there. I have to pay for my own gas to get there, but when I get there, they pay for my gas that I use. So it's like I'm getting it for free. I'm getting free hotels. Sure. sure. So that's a big element of it. Um, but I love people. Like mm -hmm. I am I'm so obsessed with people and stories and mm -hmm. characters. Sure. Like people I meet along the ride. Like I like I I worked with these people. I, I performed in a garage in New Brunswick in the small town Bucktoosh, New Brunswick. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> small French Canadian settlement. And I, this guy, so the thing, it's just a funny story. So in Bactouche, which is just outside of Shediac, you're, uh, you're right outside of, of uh, Fredericton and Moncton. Okay. And uh, all the guys already either have or don't want to get DUIs. Mm. And there's no bars in Bactouche or Shediac. So they there's become this culture where people put bars in their garages. Or above their garages. Okay. So this guy, uh, super nice guy. I'll leave his name out because he what he what he did was is he got hurt on a job site and he like sued the company and the government or whatever for like millions of dollars. Sure. Uh, sure. And he built this massive house and a secondary, basically the size of a regular house in Hamilton, but it's his garage. The whole bottom floor is cars and ATVs and tractors and whatever. And the entire second deck is, it looks like a Boston pizza. Like you walk in, there's neon and dartboards and he's got a stage built in the corner with lights and full sound system wow. yeah. and uh, a full bar with, again, with neon lights and leather couches and huge TVs and whatever. And he's got like the bar in town, but mm-hmm. it's not licensed. Oh. It's like BYOB or I'll give you beer or whatever. Sure. Long story short, everyone's a musician in New Brunswick. They're all like Acadian. They play the the guitar or they sing or they play the spoons or whatever they do right um so they have this culture where the, every every garage bar has a stage i met a guy on the road in calgary turns out he was from baktouche and he knew the guy and he said he wanted to have me long story short i did a garage show sure with like 80 people from new brunswick and then after the show it was just a party so I'm like meeting everybody. I'm dancing. I'm singing. Whatever. Yeah. And they're all playing music. We're drinking. We're doing shots. And it's like those shows are the most memorable. Yeah, I opened for Sebastian and I opened for Russell Peters at the Comedy Store. Huge shows. Mm-hmm. People are like, what are your favorite shows? And I'm like, oh, I did a Garage in New Brunswick <laughs> once, and it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know. And then what happened was, is yeah. so I'm like, so where am I sleeping? I'm thinking I'm sleeping in the big house, right? And he's like, actually, I have your bed right here. And he has a Murphy bed that pulled out no of the way. wall. And they have it for when people are bombed. Oh, yeah. And they just can't go home. And so he just pulls down the bed. And he's like, you're here. And I'm like, all right, everybody. Perfect. Get out of my room. I got to be in Frederickton tomorrow. So they sure that people just got up and just left. I swept the floor and then went to bed. Sure, wow. So sure. it was uh, those kind of experiences I really love. Like, that's my favorite part of my job. And yeah, I get paid for it. And and uh, I make a full living doing stand-up comedy. Sure. Um, but, you know, traveling people's stories, man. Like, nobody has stories like me. I've been on the road for the last... I've been doing comedy 13 years. I started touring when I was about five or six years in. So okay. let's call that seven years I've been on the road. Wow. Uh, wow. And um, I just I just love it. I just simply... I wouldn't do it if I didn't love it. Like, I just yeah. booked a show in Sioux Lookout. It's okay. like a 20-hour drive away from here. Okay. I'm going to do shows all the way up. Okay. And then okay. I go from Sioux Lookout to Kenora, which is basically Manitoba. Mm-hmm. Like, it's the mm-hmm. town that you get to before you get to Manitoba. Sure. If I describe to people, like, what I do, like, okay, so I get in the car and I drive eight hours and then I do a show and then I go to sleep and I wake up and I drive eight hours and I do a show and I go to sleep and I wake up and I drive eight hours. People are like, what? Like, I put 127,000 kilometers on my car in a year and a half. Hmm. That's people don't drive that in their entire life. Sure. Like some people will be like, like if my fiance or if anybody is in my car and they're chirping my driving, I'd go, listen, I've probably driven more miles in reverse than you have forward <laughs> yeah. in your life. <laughs> it's like, you cannot talk. I, I mean, the only accident I've ever been in, I got hit by a drunk driver and they rode off my car and I got a brand new car from zero after I already put 127,000 <laughs> kilometers on the last one. It's like, it worked out. The so. one scenario where it works out, you know, yeah. getting hit by a drunk driver, that's terrible. I wouldn't Jesus. recommend getting hit by a no. drunk driver, but it does have its perks. Uh, yeah, free sure. car, free massages. Sure, cool. sure. <laughs> Everybody tells you how much they love you. It's great. It's a real attention getter. (laughs) Oh, wow. That's awesome. So if you book a show like that, that's 20 hours away, then you would now try and reach out to a bunch of like uh, stand up spots on the way down to that show. So what I'll do is like, if I'm routing a tour, like, uh, it's like, I just got booked in, uh, in Prince Edward County on the way up to towards Kingston area. Mm -hmm. And I know the guy, great venue, similar idea. Actually, this guy's had something called the Cadillac ranch. He used to own the Cadillac lounge in Toronto. He sold that, built the Cadillac ranch Mm -hmm. in uh, Prince Edward County. Same idea, full barn. Bottom of the barn is all Cadillacs. Second level of the barn is a bar. 
and has a stage. This guy's like a huge music guy. So sure. anyways, I'm doing him and I was like, oh, okay. So that's Saturday the 23rd or whatever. I went, oh, I could probably go like Napanee or something. I'm like, who do I know in Napanee? Reach out, blah, 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 a couple guys. Oh, there's this guy. He's got this thing called uh, the uh, Doghouse Studios, a music venue, but they're trying to branch into comedy. You should send him a message. Boom, 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 boom. Talk to him on the phone. Work out the deal. Great. We're going to do this, this, this. Great. I make them a poster. I send it. That show's booked. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to be in that area, I should do Kingston. So then I call it the same idea. Kingston, who should I do? Blah, 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 book. Incredible. That's kind of how you work it. Yeah. You can't just do that being an open micer. Right. You know, this is 13 mm. years of connections and friends and comedians and whatever. Sure. You know, every show I get, like, I don't have an, I don't have an agent. I was going to ask. I yeah. don't have a manager. I don't yeah. have a booker. I don't have a tour router. Yeah. Well, cool. uh, I don't have an editor. I don't have a, I make my own posters. I do all my own promotion. I do my own Instagram. Sure. I sure. do my own editing on my videos. Yeah. I got a guy I work with now, but you know, all that I do myself, it's, I'm a self-sustaining machine, sure, you know, sure. and that is the only way that you can do it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Especially in Canada. Like mm-hmm. there are no, com- there's comedy agents. Right. I've been signed to both of them. They both tried to rip me off within sure. the first couple months of working with them. Okay. Oh, okay. And I went, okay, well you're fired. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to continue to do this myself. <laughs> yeah, sure. true, true. Um, so that's kind of what I do. Yeah. Uh, I'll route, like there's a guy in, uh, his name is Mark Manai. He lives in Thunder Bay. Mm-hmm. He owns a company called Campfire Comedy, Prom- uh, Campfire Comedy Promotions or Productions or whatever. Sure. He books Thunder Bay, but he also books Sioux Lookout, Kenora, Your Falls, like all these other places. Right. I booked Thunder <laughs> Bay with him and I go, what else can we do? I go, I'm, if I'm coming on there on the weekend, he goes, okay, we'll do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So then I went, okay, well, I'm going to be in Thunder Bay. I got to drive up to Thunder Bay. I'll go, I'll do Brace Bridge on the way up and then I'll do North Bay and then I'll do Sault Ste. Marie and then I'll, <laughs> then I'll, I'm in Blind River. And that's another promotion. Her name's Leslie Lynn. She owns um, Laugh Local North. Okay. Message her. Boom, 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 boom. Now I'm doing like a... And then I have to drive home from Kenora, which is going to suck. Sure. Uh, but in that case, I'm like, oh, I'm going to be this way. I'll come around this way. I'll go to Chicago. I could do six shows in Chicago at the Laugh Factor. I'll send that email. And then I come home. So uh, then it's like... Unreal. You, but that, again, that takes years of... Um, grinding, man. Grinding. Yeah. Like, and connections, too. If someone... I always... I, and, I, and I have to swear for this part because it's part of the story. <laughs> Give her. Give her. Bleep, bleep it out. <laughs> uh, I always say to this people, like people when they're trying to get into comedy or trying to like... Or if an open micer is trying to advance to try to be a feature act, a feature act to a headliner or MC or whatever, mm-hmm. I always say to them, I go, it's a shit storm. It's quite literally a shit storm and I've just learned how to build an umbrella. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is people will come into the end as a, maybe they've been doing it two years and they see a guy like me and they're like, I want to be like you. And then they try to come over and they try to stand underneath my umbrella. Okay. And I mm-hmm. go, no, no, no. I've built this umbrella myself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you how to build an umbrella. If you go to Sault Ste. Marie, there's a basement bar and blah, 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 blah. There's a, it, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Theoretically or figuratively, there's a handle for the umbrella in that basement. Sure. It's like a video game. You go, you beat the boss, you do the show, you get the handle. That's a piece of your umbrella. And sure. there's also a corporate gig down in Sarnia. That it pays a lot, but the audience does not care. But that handle for the umbrella is in there. And over hmm. time, yeah. you can build your umbrella all the way up and you can shoot it out this way and you build a canopy and then you could just comfortably stand in this shit storm that is show business. Sure. Right. I am so comfortable in this shit storm. I have one of those beach umbrellas that you get that you steal from the <laughs> wave. Pool. It's like a sail and it could literally be a hurricane shit storm. I'm like, this is fine. I'm comfortable. I know what I'm doing. Sure. Right. It's fine. Sure. And sometimes you get a little shit in your face you know, you, <laughs> yeah. and you go, oh God, I should have known that. You know, I, you, it's like you can see a problem coming from far ahead, and you go, I should fix that leak in the umbrella or I'm going to get shit on my face. Sure, sure. But then you go, nah, I'll be fine. And then you get shit on your face, and you got to get up there or whatever and fix your shit umbrella. Shit off the face. You're going to be doing a lot of bleep beeping in this yeah, part. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's so funny. Uh, I, I run a bubble soccer events company, and yeah. it's so funny. Like, you know, we go to festivals, and it's like just chaos. Like, mm. bubbles everywhere, kids everywhere, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, in the beginning, like, that'd be really stressful. But now I'm like, don't worry, we'll figure it out. You know, we'll see like one thing at a time and work it out. And that's the thing that, you know, over time you develop. Just organize chaos. Exactly. And if you don't know how to organize yourself in that chaos, you'll never survive. Sure. You know, like the first time, like I used to do a show on YTV called Splat a lot, where I used to literally attack children. And it was (laughs) the craziest thing in the world. So it was like American Gladiators. 
uh, and uh, what's the word? Wipeout, the TV show Wipeout, oh, yeah. and American Gladiators that, mixed yeah. together for children in a medieval setting. Uh, and for the online content, we can throw to a clip of the show right here. Ding. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll teach you how to do that. Yeah. Uh, I learned it myself. Um, yeah, yeah. But my, I was a defender on the show, so I was basically one of the American Gladiator guys, and yeah. it was chaos. Like kids would be flying like through the air with goo and foam right i've been trying to shoot them out of the air and like and well i'm filming a tv show so i have an earpiece in my ear getting like direction whatever there was no script mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um it was all improv so they'd be like this is robbie he's 12 years old and he doesn't want to be here but his mom signed him up for spot a lot and i would just lay into him <laughs> yeah. hamilton style just <laughs> sharp him, while spraying him with foam rubber balls yeah i just thought of spot when you said rubber soccer or whatever with the rubber you know bubble thing um and it was chaos and you learned how to in that space maybe a kid falls and gets hurt you go it's okay get up yeah first sure. of all you signed a waiver so uh, <laughs> i can't do anything for you but you're fine just know that you got to do the car wheel to get yourself back up on your feet like you know sure, what i mean sure. you've learned that yeah. whereas someone just started your business like oh i got a kid who got hurt and the parents are gonna sue and you get no it's fine i've organized i've organized this chaos yes yeah just like splat a lot was organized chaos and then i got paid handsomely for it so. sure sure and some people don't some people just don't have the wherewithal or the composure <laughs> To, to handle no, chaos. No, yeah. People are whips. <laughs> yeah. You gotta handle it. You can't yeah. handle it. Get out of the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, what would you say, Eric? Is like one of the like toughest parts of your job, like the worst part uh, that you kind of dread a little bit. Well, you know, it's funny. I said it was the best part, but the worst part is the travel. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's my favorite part, but it's the worst part. Sure. Right. Like I'm 32, turning 33 in July. Mm. I already have like sciatic nerve pain in my hip from sitting in a car for 15 mm. hours at a time. Sure. I lug in all my own merchandise. My back is constantly hurt. I'm seeing a fascia stretch therapist and the Hamilton back clinic for my lower back and hip because of my job. Sure. It's like I have stressors on my body mm-hmm. that are not good. Like I like my, my fiance is is 36. She'll be turning 36. And she's like, she's always, I'm always like, oh God, my back. And she's like, I got a younger model. Like <laughs> you should not be complaining like this. Yeah, yeah. And whatever. And I'm working out and all that kind of stuff and doing some proper stretching now. But you know, my body is take definitely taking a toll. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't drink as much on the road as I used to, but I used to drink every night on the road. That's probably not good for you. Sure. Uh, I used to vape like an animal, like highly addicted to nicotine. Right. Uh, I'm done with that. Um, you know, and that was from like, okay, I just got to get to the next town. I'm just like flying down the highway in Saskatchewan, just vaping out the window. <laughs> and I think the biggest thing is time away. You know, I miss a lot of stuff. I miss yeah. a lot of birthdays and, and I miss a lot of get togethers. And there was a time with my friends, they never excommunicated to me, excommunicated me, but they basically just stopped inviting me, sure. you know, because they knew I probably couldn't come. Mm-hmm. And that's not good. You know, guys you grew up with your entire life, and you don't get invited to a birthday party. I go, what, what the fuck? And they go, well, we didn't think you could come. I go, I can't come, but I'd like to be invited, sure, uh, right. you know. And time away from my fiance and my, you know, my my family and stuff like that. They understand this is the life that I've chosen. And, mm-hmm. and in a way, it was chosen for me. I was born into this entertainment show yeah. business lifestyle. Um, but it's tough. You know, it's sad. Sometimes you're... Sitting in a hotel room in, in, in wherever in Sudbury eating fucking Mr. Noodles and, and watching Storage Wars being like, what is my life? You know, and but that that same night you killed to 150 people. Sure. You know, so it's like it's it's a different it's a different beast that you have to conquer the mental and the time away and the loneliness. It's a really lonely lifestyle. Mm-hmm. I don't usually travel with openers. I usually just I use an opener for every town that I go to mm-hmm. for two reasons. A, I don't want to travel with anybody uh b it's cheaper for me because uh you know i don't have to pay for a second mouth and bed and whatever i have an opening act sure and c and this is the biggest reason the most true and the most genuine reason is i like to give local comedians the opportunity mm-hmm. my, when i was at, when i first started doing stand-up my biggest opportunities are when a headliner came into town and was looking for an opening act mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so i like to give that back to the road so if i get into you know, swift current, I go, who's good in town, you know, sure, whatever. Sure. And right. I'll find out mm-hmm. and go, Hey, come open for me tonight. And they're like, what? You know, and it's, and I give them, you know, I'll give them a couple hundred bucks and 
couple drinks and just go go do your thing. And it's smart too because they'll invite all their friends. They're opening for Eric Johnston and Swift Current. Great, they invite. I sell another fifty tickets, you know. Sure, sure. So it's it's both genuine and helpful, but also strategic on my end. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But that means I spend a lot of time just me and my thoughts, you know, me right. and my phone. Thank God the Bell has like the unlimited across Canada now. Can I just call people and just shoot the shit for yeah. hours? Yeah, you know? and, true. And uh, I listen to a lot of podcasts. Yeah, and I, awesome. I actually did. I used to just listen to music. Then I got to the point where I'm like, I can't listen to any more music. Yeah. So then I got into, you know, Joe Rogan's guests if there's someone I know or uh, Joey Diaz has Uncle Joey's Joint, which is probably one of my favorite podcasts. And um, yeah, so you just, that's the best and the worst part. The best part is the traveling. The worst part is the traveling. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, what kind of advice would you give to comedians that were uh, want to get into or that just started? Yeah. I mean, I think that, like I said before, just you have to do it. Right. People go, I've ar- I've always dreamed of doing stand-up comedy. I go, you should do it. Mm-hmm. As a matter of fact, I'll get you on stage this Wednesday if you like. Could I just call the comedy club? Pat Coppolino at Levity is, we started together. He's one of my longest friends in comedy. He's coming to my wedding next week. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like, um, I need to make those calls for people. I like to make those calls for people. I go, listen, I got this guy. He wants to try it. I get him. It's a pro-am, right? So there's the pro comics come in and the, and the amateur comedians and first-timers. Sure. And then when I go, I'll get you on stage next week. Oh, no, I can't. I can't. I go, and then they, they bail. And that's fine. I can't. I'm not going to put it. Like, you get on stage right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, exactly. But my favorite thing is watching someone get a laugh. There's a, I, I, a feeling that I can't describe myself and I can't describe I get from watching people. But that idea of that first time they get a real genuine laugh. Sure. It's like a, what's your shot? Like the, like the Pulp Fiction where they yeah, right. It's adrenaline. It's like it's yeah, literally right. like I couldn't. I I can't describe it. It's like when you're with your buddies, right? right and right. and you're all standing around a circle, and you're drinking a beer, you're smoking a joint, whatever, and something go up, 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 and then someone goes, and that's why he's no longer allowed in Walmart. <laughs> and everyone goes, ah! like, you know what I mean? <laughs> that guy feels great for the that's rest true. of the day. I made everybody laugh. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I live in that space all the time. Sure, right. You sure. know, um, and I like giving it to people. I like saying, hey, go try it. Sure. Sometimes sure. they bomb and they never come back. Or sometimes they bomb and they go, I'll be here next week. Yeah, yeah. That was me. I mean, I didn't bomb my first time. I did exceptionally well for a first-time comedian, again, because of that confidence thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was re- – I immediately was like a roller coaster. I go, how can I get back on? I don't – I'll, I'll go back in line right now. How do I get back on? Yeah. So my advice to that is just do it. Fall in love with it. If you don't love it, then just don't do it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? But yeah. I always say that if you do comedy more than four times – you're a comedian for the rest of your life. Hmm. Are you a good comedian? Maybe not, but right. you're a comedian because you've got that bug inside of you that you've embraced yeah. and you're letting it run. And right. I think you should, I, most people should. Barry, who was one of your last guests, yep. he's my personal trainer. He just did it for the first time himself. Yeah, And it was, and there's actually a good thing now. Levity has a course. It's like a workshop. It's like six weeks. Mm-hmm. You workshop all your jokes and there's a graduation show and that's your first time getting on stage. Cool. Brilliant. Because it makes people, first of all, get on stage the first time in a non kind of uh, hostile environment because it's in front of their other classmates. Um, but then they get on a graduation show, which is full of their people who want to support them. Sure. And they do well. Yeah. And now Barry's bit, he wants to get on as soon as he's getting again. And I'm helping him and we're working out. And he's like, what do you think of this bit? And I go, oh, you can probably do it this way. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> we're working, we're working together. And, and that joy, he like, when he came off stage, he was like drugs. Like, right. like he was just like, that was great. I think I did really good. I'm like, dude, you did great. I like hugged him. Yeah. It was like a real camaraderie moment. Yeah, cool. Which sure. I love to give to people. Like I've, I've let, uh, just quickly, I'll tell the story. I've told it on another podcast, but I'll just, I'll breeze through it. I am living in a way now that like John Candy is one of my personal heroes because I kind of look like him. And also he's just funny and a Canadian icon. And he actually, John Candy looks a lot like my dad. So there's that connection there too. Um, but I always think of like when people go like, what would Jesus Christ do? I go, what would John Candy do? <laughs> yeah. That's how I live my life. <laughs> so I, like you hear story, like legendary stories of John Candy, like hiring homeless people to work on movie sets so they get a paycheck or, or giving people certain things. Or, you know, he was a part owner of the Argonauts and gave away tickets and stuff all the time. It was a big child foundation guy and stuff. I go, what would John Candy do? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I live that way. Like I was on tour. Swear to God, I was in tour in uh, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, my last Canadian national tour. 
I had driven all day all through the prairies and I get to Moose Jaw and I realized once I got to Moose Jaw that I didn't have an opening act. I was, I, I'd been so, I, did, I just did about eight shows back to back to back and I was just, I get to Moose Jaw. I go, I think so and so is opening and then I get there and I go, oh no, he's opening in whatever town, Red, 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 whatever, Red Deer. Red Deer, yeah. 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 And I went, oh wow, I don't have an opening act. So I'm, I go, I don't care. I, I can literally have the, the bar manager go, please welcome Eric Johnson and I'll do an hour and a half. It doesn't matter to me. Sure. Anyways, I sit down. And uh, I'm having a drink, and that's what I love to do. You can learn so much about a town if you just sit and listen. Right. So I always barely up to the bar and just grab a drink or a gin and soda, whatever it is, Mm -hmm. and I just listen to everyone talking. And in that, you can hear about politics. You can hear about who their mayor is. You can hear about how well their hockey team's doing. You can hear everything about a town in just 10 minutes sitting there. So I'm sitting there, and some guy walks in, and uh, he's like real jacked, uh, jujitsu type guy, shaved head. Yeah. And he's got shorts on and a t shirt. He comes over, he goes, You're the comedian, right? And I go, Yeah. And I go, He goes, Nice to meet you. I'm so, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, and I'm so and so. I go, Okay, cool, man. And he goes, I go, I'm Eric. And he goes, You know, I've always dreamed about getting into stand up comedy. And I go, uh, and I go, Really? He goes, Yeah, I've been writing. I, I work construction. He goes, But on my lunch break, I write down ideas for jokes. I have all these bullet points in my phone. He goes, But I live in Moose Jaw. Like, I, there's no scene here. There's no shows. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And he's telling me about it. And I go, What? I go, Tell me so what's going on. He goes, Well, I'm actually here right now uh, picking up some food. My wife is in labor right now, hmm. but it's like we're inducing her at like 11 o'clock or something. And uh, if it doesn't happen, she'll be getting a do so at 11 o'clock. So I came here now to get some food for my already existing children. I'm going to bring them home some food. I go, well, what time are you going to head back to the hospital? He goes, I was going to go back at like 9 o'clock. <laughs> and I go, well, uh, the show starts at 8. And I don't have an opening act. How would you like to do five minutes before me? He's like, what? And I go, how crazy is this? It was also his 40th birthday. Wow. And I go, how crazy? I go, it's your 40th birthday. Your wife is in labor. A headlining comedian is in town. And he needs an opening act. And your lifelong dream is to become a stand-up comic. (laughs) What would John Candy do? And that's what I said before, before I asked him. Sure, sure. I go, you need to open this show. And I've given that offer to a couple people in my time. Right. And they don't take it. They go, oh, no, I caught you already. Thanks. They they have fear. Yeah. I always say that God or the universe, I think I stole this from Will Smith, which feels weird because I hate Will Smith. Uh, no, I don't hate him. I love I love Fresh Prince. I just <laughs> Was it after the slap? After or? the slap, I lost <laughs> a lot of respect yeah. for Will Smith. Right. You don't hit a comedian no matter what happens. Uh, but I think I stole it from Will Smith when he said that God or the universe, whatever you believe in, puts the best things in life on the other side of fear. And uh, this guy was afraid, but he went, okay. And I said one thing. I said, go home and give your food to your kids. And I go, and put some pants on because you're not fucking wearing shorts on my stage. And he went, okay, okay. And he went home. He came back in like jeans and a nice button up shirt. Sure. And uh, I think his name was, I can't remember his name. It doesn't matter. His name was Brad. Yeah, yeah. And I go up on stage. The lights go down, lights go up. It's in a, like a pub, but a pub that has like a stage and proper setup, right? And and uh, they go, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here, Johnson shows about to start, whatever. And I, I walked out and I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Eric Johnson. I go, but this is highly irregular. This never happens, but I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine. He's making his stand-up comedy debut. Please welcome Brad. Turns out he was the bouncer at the restaurant above the thing, so everybody knew everybody him. Everybody knew him. So oh, he walked wow. out on stage, and people were like, wow. What happened? Just going off. Right? And then yeah. he did really well. Okay. Wow. He had some bits that, like, before he went on stage, he was, like, like running them by me. He's like, I was thinking about doing a bit like this. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, I go, tell me about yourself. I go, what's your story? He goes, well, I'm half Scottish, half Jamaican. I went, stop right there. That's already funny. <laughs> I go, what's your story? He goes, I'm from Ontario, but I met some girl. I moved out here to Moose Jaw. And I go, a woman? I go, it must be a good relationship if a woman made you move to Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And he starts riffing on it. And he's making me laugh. And I went, go with this. Yeah. I go, don't yeah. even look at your phone. Sure. Just... Go with what your is in your heart and is your story. Yeah, and he did it. He went up in the, like five ten minutes. Wow! And then he came off stage again like he was on drugs, <laughs> right? And he was like, "That was so great." And I went, "I gotta go on stage." And I went on stage and I did an hour. Yeah. And about ten minutes into the show, he stood up from his chair and started running out of the room. 
And he goes, my wife is in labor. I have to go, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> there he goes. So he it was Nathan. 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 Shout Nathan out Nathan. Nathan, Nathan if you're listening to this. That's unreal, man. And I go, ladies and gentlemen, please, big round of applause for Nathan. And yeah. then he went off, and I'm sure she had the baby. Yeah. And now he has that story for the rest of his life. That's awesome, wow. man. So when Incredible. I inevitably become a star, that is, I'm already am in my mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my in my my uh, astral projections, sure, sure. he's gonna go. I open for that guy in Moose Jaw one time. Sure. And they go, what? Yeah. Because it was my 40th birthday. My wife was in labor. And now he's got a story that he's gonna carry with the rest of his life. Hmm. That is now what excites me more sure. than anything. More sure. than anything I've done. Almost taking the umbrella and yeah. letting people have you know. I'll let someone in for a right? sec. You yeah, know? yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. You, that's incredible, and I, I love that. You know, yeah. like in the spur of the moment, just being like, "Damn, like you know what? This could be a really cool experience and a lot of fun." And you have this story now, right? For the rest yeah. of your life. I mean, I brag about it because something really nice that I did. <laughs> yeah, but I brag about it in the way sure. because I go, "I'm so happy that that guy is is gonna have that for the rest of his life." Sure. Because for me, it's just like it's just like it's like being in the mafia it's just another kill i just go on to a town and kill another kill again you know yeah. what i mean but yeah. to them it's like that's the most important day of their life if they let it be right. sure you know on like with the children and stuff but then he's got this whole other element of it yeah it's exciting for yeah. you know and yeah. it's a fan for life you know which is yeah. really, really yeah cool. and he like still follows someone me that... and likes all my stuff he's probably liking something of mine right now yeah. um sure well, yeah dude, all that kind of stuff so yeah even uh building relationships too like some of the greatest relationships can come from that of course, you know, friendships. And I mean, when I was single, I built, I built some other types of relationships on the road. Uh, not too many because I was usually in and out of town before any Bumble or Tinder knew I was there. But, yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, but that's, that's, it's an attractive quality. You never sure. want to be friends with a comic, sure. right? You know, awesome, I have a lot of great close friends, but I probably have 10,000 acquaintances. Sure. Where I can go into a town and go, oh, my buddy lives here. Send him a message. Oh, yeah, come on down. We're here. And whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I watched the Buffalo Bills game in Calgary with my buddy from Ontario and all of his friends who were from Ontario who live in Calgary. Sure. We're all ordering wigs and cheers and for the Bills. You're and a stuff. Bills fan? Yeah. I mean, I became Bills one. Bills Mafia? Yeah. I, it's, <laughs> well, I was always like, oh, I like the Bills because they're like geographical convenience. It's the closest team to us. It's, sure. the, game, it's the team that you can go to games. Yeah. But I think during the pandemic when the NFL was the only live sports that you could watch – I was like, I think I really like the Bills. And then I started following it more intently and, you know, bought the, you know, go to games and buy the jersey and all that kind of stuff. But, sure, yeah. sure. That's a good uh, one. Organized sports I never played, so I can never connect to it on that level. Right. Uh, you know, because I was doing dance uh, in musical theater and theater. Yeah. Yeah. So I wasn't like, oh, let's go strap on the bag. You know what I mean? We'll go play some football. Like, yeah. Like I would catch like this. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not an athlete. But, <laughs> oh, that's great. awesome, man. So even for like people that are listening or watching the podcast and they're like someone that does stand up and they're like, yeah. oh, dude, I, I do it like maybe once a month or like they've been out a bunch of times or whatnot. And if they're like, you know, what, I'm thinking about maybe making this a career and yeah. I want to ask for my first like or try and find gigs. So like, for instance, like you, like what was your first like paid gig and how much did you make and how did you get oh, that? I don't remember my first paid gig. Like I remember. Like there was a time where you got like twenty bucks for gas. Sure, you were like a star. Yeah, yeah like they yeah. got twenty bucks and two drink tickets. Um, <laughs> I'm like I'm making it. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when someone. Yeah, I remember the first time I got paid a thousand dollars to do stand up. Okay. That was a corporate gig. It was an awful gig. It was an <laughs> Aston Martin meetup in an airplane hangar in Toronto at Pearson. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a friend, a corporate client of my mom's. My mom used to work for the Bank of Montreal. And he found out that I was a comedian and wanted me to perform at his Aston Martin meetup. Sure. Unfortunately, it was inside of an airplane hangar, which sounds cool. Uh, however, sound in an airplane hangar, not good. Not good. Right. So there was, it was like a, all, what they did was all the guys with Austin, Aston Martins came in and parked in like a big, perimeter and other like lamborghinis and alfa romeo cars and stuff with a big high-end car meetup sure and they parked around the perimeter inside the airplane hangar and in, in the middle there was all like you know maybe 20 round tables with 10 seats at them and then a stage and a pa and the pa was facing the people in the in the uh you know the round uh, tables but maybe only the first two tables could actually hear me because once the sound went out, it went up. Mm. And we're just, I'm like, hi, 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 Like, it was crazy. Okay. Not only that, we were parked in the area where all the private jets land. Mm -hmm. And R.A. Dickey, who was the 
pitcher for the Jays at the time, landed in his private jet and pulled up and someone said, hey, there's a really cool car show going on over here. You should go check it out. So in the middle of my set, I'm supposed to do like 45 minutes, which I didn't even have at the time. Um, and and R.A. Dickey walks in. People were getting up and going like, R.A., can I got a picture with you. I got a picture with him like in the middle of the set. <laughs> you know? and, and, and then I go back on the mic and um, – I start bombing like bad because mm-hmm. no one can hear me. All right, Dickie's in the room. People are drunk. They're rich people, so they're entitled to themselves. Sure. So people start to leave to go home. Mm. However, their cars are parked in the same oh. building I am performing in. No and way. the exit is next to the stage. So people – like. Walking in the industry of comedy, they go, I walked a couple people, which means I was doing so bad that people got up and left, but mm-hmm. walking an audience member. Okay. I walked them to their cars and then they drove out. So I'm on stage being like, so I'm moving out of my mom's house. And like a, a $100,000 Aston Martin would just drive by me and they would like waving goodbye. Yeah. And everyone's looking at the cars. Sure. It was so rough. But then I remember at the end of the night, the guy goes, you know, maybe comedy wasn't the best idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He goes, because he was sitting in the front, so he could actually hear me. Yeah, right. So he actually enjoyed the show, but he goes, these people behind me, they had no idea what was going on. Yeah. Right. But anyways. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for and, coming. And <laughs> handed me a check for $1,000. It was like he handed me a check for a million dollars. Yeah. Right. Now my standard guarantee is 1000 I won't show up for less than 1000 okay. okay. But at that time, it was like, oh, my God. A thousand dollars? Really? Hmm. Yeah. And and yeah. yeah. So but I mean that was that's how I that was my first time I got really paid. Sure. But other than that, it's like has something first of all, you have to be good. Mm. You know, and that's that's a relative term. Good for where you're at. Sure. I should say. So if you're an open micer, you have to be the best open micer of all the open micers. Mm-hmm. And that only comes from showing up every week, doing new jokes, new material, crafting the material. Mm-hmm. And I always tell comics, don't get involved in the bullshit. And the bullshit is Comics, open, especially open mic comics, are egomaniacs. And a lot of them are mentally ill. Like, mm-hmm. let's get that clear. In comedy, there's a lot of people with mental illness. And I understand that there's that's a whole, we, I want to embrace mental illness and people getting the support they need. I'm not saying that. Mm-hmm. But most mentally ill people who are egomaniacs tend to fight with other people who are mentally ill, me- egomaniacs. Mm-hmm. So there's all this drama that gets churned up, especially in the open mic scene sure. where i hate that guy he talked during my set and he said i wasn't funny and his girlfriend thought i was funnier than him and then you just hear these fights and then what happened is is a lot of guys will quit because they go i don't want to be involved in this drama sure and they just quit mm-hmm. right no, no no just don't be involved in the drama show up do your job leave right, right. i've never been a hang around comic and that caused drama with me because i would just come in do the show shake some hands go home that was my job. Right. I treated it like a job, like almost military esque. I'm like, I have to come in and do this job and then have a drink or two and leave. Got it. What early on in my career, who do you make fun of? The guy who's not there. And mm-hmm. I was never there after when they were all smoking joints or sitting around and telling them each other how funny they all are. Sure, sure. Ninety percent of those guys have all quit now. Right. So I always tell comics, stay out of that drama, stay out of the bullshit. Mm-hmm. Um and do something that sets you apart. And what I mean by that is, is there's a comic, a feature comic in Montreal. Every time he has a really expensive, like Canon camera like this, every time he opens for me, he films my set for me or he takes pictures. Yeah. I know that. And it saves me from having to lug my camera and my stuff in. So when I go to Montreal, I go, Hey, can you put so-and-so on the show? Cause he's like a feature comic. He's decent. Yeah, but I know I'm gonna get some footage out of them. So it's like, mm-hmm. as a headliner, I am I'm trying to get people around me who can. I'll help them if they help me. If he films my set, I'll put them on. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. A lot of comics like that who I think they advance. Also, a lot of comics get a lot of work based on them being a good hang. What I mean by that is someone you can hang out with all day. Okay. Because if you're going to do the road together, say you're driving, you're going up to Sudbury, and you're bringing a feature act with you or an opening act with you. Mm-hmm. I usually don't bring an opener, but a lot of guys do. And that means that you're going to be in a car for the four hour and 20 minute drive up to Sudbury, plus the time you get to check into the hotel and get to the venue, eat together, then do the show together, then sleep in the hotel and drive the four hours and 20 minutes back to Hamilton. Mm-hmm. That's a long commitment. And if you're an asshole or a weirdo, people don't want to be around you. Sure. So when you're that kind of jerky ego 
guy, which I kind of was when I first started, and I learned very quick not to be. Um, people don't want to be around you, so you don't get a lot of work. Yeah. So you eventually end up quitting. Right. And I think what happens in comedy too is it's a very, especially in smaller scenes, smaller tight knit community scenes like Hamilton's one, Barry's another one, Ottawa's another one, where they're all in it together, they're all doing well together mm -hmm. until one of them starts to do better than everybody else. Okay. And then they all turn on that one guy. Crabs in the bucket. Like, crabs in the bucket so yeah. they're always like the second they're like, where are you going we're all in this together where yeah. are you going we're all in this together and then none of them make it and all of them quit you know right. what i mean and that's right. unfortunate mm -hmm. that's a big part of the scene yeah i never i never listened to anyone i never got involved in the drama and if i got involved in the drama i shut it down immediately um and it I, and the biggest thing i'll teach any comic is it's called show business for a reason there is an incredible amount of business that you have to do to be a stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. If you don't do any of that, if you don't reach out, if you don't follow up, if you don't show up, if you don't do well, if you don't shake hands, if you don't have a business card, if you don't have a website, if you don't have an Instagram page, all that stuff, if you don't have any of those things and you're wanting to be a comic, you're going to have a really tough time. True. Like if anyone wants to find me on Instagram, they just put in Eric Johnston or Eric Johnston who, you'll get my Facebook, my TikTok, my Instagram, my website, my email. It's all the same. Yeah. Biggest thing that drives me insane is when I go, you're really funny, man. How do I find you? He goes, well, my Instagram is uh, comedylover69. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't have a website. My Facebook's just my name, which I don't even know his name. Uh, my TikTok is I dance a lot com. Like, I go, what's your name? And sure. Brad Simpson. I go, Brad Simpson comedy. That's it. Just make it that yeah. for everything. Instagram, TikTok, your website, whatever. Yeah. Um, that being said, I wouldn't recommend that an open micer who's done one set gets a business card that says Brad Simpson comedian on a website that's like them being like stand up comic <laughs> extraordinaire. You got to be a cop, some chops and some time into it. Yeah. Sure, sure. But I think when that time comes, when you want to be more than an open micer, yeah. you have to take those steps to become a businessman. Sure. I'm an incredible business. I'm a great comic. But I'm an incredible businessman. Yeah, I yeah. love it. You know? I see that too. I mean, great, uh, great website, great marketing, all that kind of stuff. And especially if you don't have an agent, you're doing yeah. all that stuff yourself. The yeah. follow up, the calling, all yeah. that kind of stuff too. What would you say is your biggest accomplishment in comedy? Um, I think the fact that I just don't have another job is a huge accomplishment as a, as a Canadian comic. Yeah. Like the fact that I make a full living as a stand up comic is incredible. Incredible, and that's not to yeah. pat, pat, pat myself on my back because Canadians are afraid to do that. Afraid. A lot of Canadian comics will be like, so what do people ask me, what's your goal? And I go, I want to be the biggest comic in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And they go, what? It's such a crazy thing to say as a Canadian comic. Sure. And they immediately go negative. Like this fucking guy is going to be the biggest <laughs> comic in the entire world. <laughs> but I'd say that purposely because if I aim for less, I'll get less than that. Sure. If I aim to be the biggest comic in the entire world, mm -hmm. if I fall short, I'm going to be very successful. Sure. Um, and that alone is my, I feel like my biggest accomplishment in the fact that, again, I don't have an agent. I don't have a manager. I don't have a graphic designer. I don't have an editor. I don't have a writer. I don't have a driver. I don't have a router. I don't, you're looking at all of that right here. Mm -hmm. I earn my own shirts. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. and then someone great shirt. Fabulous. Great shirt. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Before I left here, I was like to my fiance, I go, lemons or oranges? <laughs> She goes, I think it's a lemon day. And I go, me too. Me too. And I start hiring it. I'm like, yeah, I'm coming right now. I'm just pressing the shirt. Sure. That's great. Wow. You know, I think that, I mean, obviously the, the opening for Russell Peters, one of the reasons why I am a comic is because I watched Russell Peters comedy now when I was like 14 years old sure. and cried laughing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I grew up watching comedy and I've opened for a lot of my heroes. I've, I've become friends with a lot of my heroes mm -hmm. in Canadian comedy, in American comedy. I think the biggest thing for me was performing at the comedy store. Um, that, if you know anything about comedy, is that's the mecca. That's it. I mean, maybe sure. not so much anymore now that Joe Rogan's in Austin and now he's got the comedy mothership or whatever. But when I was at the store, I only did two shows there, but it's on my resume. Like, wow. I seen on the comedy store, which is a little hacky, but I don't give a shit. Yeah, it's a huge sick. accomplishment to sure. walk onto the main stage of the comedy store to a room that was sold out of. I think 350 people. It was the Canada Today comedy special. So it was a, a show full of Canadian comics. So it was like Russell, Tom Green, Howie Mandel, uh, hmm. all these like big, massive Canadian comics and me, you know, and I'm sitting in the green with them, yeah. talking to them. And That's I'm like, cool, this man. is so 
crazy. And when he went, please welcome Eric Johnson. And I stepped through the thing. It was the first true out of body experience I've ever experienced in my life. I felt like, and I did it twice, two years back to back, but I felt like in that moment, I was levitating above my own body, watching myself perform at the comedy store. And I went right back. Thank you. Good night. Walk through the thing. I had no idea what happened. Wow, dude. I had no, I I had no, I had no, I don't, I don't remember the set. I remember it going well. Yeah. Yeah. I had to follow Jason Rouse. And if your listeners or viewers Google Jason Rouse, he's like the darkest, dirtiest comic uh, one of all time, okay. I'd say. Yeah. The guy is filthy, hilarious, but absolutely filthy. Like I would, I could even, if I even tried to quote one of his bits on here, we'd have to cut the whole thing out. You know sure, what I mean? Sure. So I won't. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But I had to, because I know you're a struggle with the editing program. Yeah. Um, no, but I had to follow him. So I was a little scared, to be honest. And I went out there and I just didn't give a shit. I just went out and just, and I don't remember what happened. I remember doing well and I did so well that Russell, I came backstage and Russell said, oh man, what happened out there? You stink. Which is a comic's way of saying you did very well. <laughs> you know, a comic would, if a comic went, cool. good job, you're like, uh, I don't think I did that good. But it's, when someone tells you you suck, it's a yeah. compliment to comedy. Um, unreal. And he went like, oh, what happened? You suck. <laughs> yeah. I went, thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. Dude, I went to the parking lot and I cried. I literally cried. In the no way. In the comedy store. I couldn't believe it. That's amazing. Oh, and, wow. you know, I that going on my resume, people go, so what have you done? I go, well, I performed at the comedy store. And they go, okay, so what date do you want to come? You're trying to book for what price? You know sure, what I mean? Sure. It's yeah. a huge accomplishment in my career. Incredible. So that and, you know. Uh, to make it you know more emotional, I have an amazing woman who I didn't meet through comedy, but she's a woman who, who I'm marrying in eight days. Congratulations. Uh, thank you very That's much. Awesome. Who really loves comedy. And she loves coming to my shows. And she loves watching me perform. Having that in my life is so important. Like mm-hmm. I used to go on dates, Tinder dates with chicks. And they're like, so like you're a comedian, but like what's your plan to be? Mm-hmm. And I would, I, I go, I don't have one. Yeah. You know, so and, you and I would... I had sex with them, but then I throw. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> but but then I would be like, "Thanks meeting you." Here's, uh, here's Plan B. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Plan B. That's funny. There you go. And here's your Plan B. Yeah. I keep them in my glove box. <laughs> uh, but you know, when I when Jana, my fiance, I told her I was a comic. She's like, "No way, that's so cool." Mm. And she's like my business manager. Like she. I got money coming in. She's like, okay, you should put this in this and we're going to make an investment property and what, like she's on top of it, you know, and that is a huge accomplishment for me that I found someone that I love like that. But you know, Mm -hmm. with that comedy that she's okay with what I do. I mean, if I was an open micer, not making any money might be a different story. She's a successful real estate agent. I don't want to, she's selling million dollar homes and I'm like, I got a spot downtown for two drink tickets. I don't know if that's going to (laughs) work, Yeah, but I did all that work in my early twenties and throughout my entire twenties. Now I'm 32 years old, Mm -hmm. a established headlining stand-up comic. And I meet this amazing businesswoman, real estate agent. We came together and we're getting married. Wow. So that's, I think, you know, of all those things. And and they say, you know, like between, behind like every strong man is an even stronger woman you yeah. know and and you know she's weak though I can't. <laughs> yeah. don't give her all the credit no. <laughs> okay. yeah. power bottom the shit it's out of that butter. shit yeah, okay. yeah no. no but she, no, I, I totally agree with you dude yeah, I, yeah. and honestly like we were friends with uh with the owner of her her company we went to florida with them and it's uh, this guy named dan and, and his wife susan and they are like a power couple like she's a business um like manager person business coach yeah. you know whatever and he's like this powerful businessman and i like watch them interact and i go that's first of all we have but we could even get even more like like them mm, like, sure sure they're trying to take over the world awesome and so am i you know and and so yeah having that is is huge for me so yeah yeah, yeah. yeah very cool wow that's awesome man jesus <laughs> well i think we're gonna wrap up the podcast <laughs> i was gonna say what time we <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hour. it's probably the longest <laughs> one that it has yeah definitely yeah. i mean you any uh, questions left i'll answer them. <laughs> yeah. this machine answer no, <laughs> just... i'll give you one worders <laughs> well usually like in the podcast asking every uh guest you know if you could give uh, yourself 20 year old advice what would it be uh I mean, I started doing stand up when I was 20. So <laughs> I would go back and be like, hey, stick this out. It works out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 
go lie to Johnny Scoop and tell him you're already a comic. Which yeah. I was like, oh, I'm on my way. That's you know? cool, man. Uh, I think I would tell any any myself, but any 20 year old, you know, it sounds like an MTV ad, but I would tell them that it's gonna be okay. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of self doubt, and especially in my industry of like people, there's you know, it's it's a te- it's a crazy industry, like show business in general, but stand up comedy, like this, the chances of making it are so slim, mm-hmm. but that's okay. Those chances really weed out the people who aren't that serious. Right. You know, Seth Rogen goes, I thought I wanted to be a stand-up comic until I met people who really wanted to be a stand-up comic. But then he shifted and became a comedic actor, writer, and whatever went that path. But he started in stand-up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to see what happens with the rest of my career with acting. I just did a guest starring role on Fargo for Apple TV. And, and you know, I love that side of it. But when I say it's going to be okay, I mean, no matter, no matter what you land on, in, especially in show business, you're going to find your way. Everything happens for a reason. I truly believe. Mm-hmm. You know, I've had so many like opportunities where like a gig goes away for whatever reason, like, oh, blah, 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 now it's not happening. I'm like, shit. And then I get a call like the next day of someone offering me a gig three times as big for three times as much money on the exact date that the one just canceled. Sure. And it's like everything happens for a reason. Mm-hmm. I would say to any 20-year-old – in general but especially in show businesses like just keep showing up Mm -hmm. you have to just keep showing up and being the best version of the entertainer that you are of yourself because in the end you'll be truly truly happy like i'm the the happiest i've ever been in my entire life my career is on fire i'm making you know excellent money i'm marrying an amazing girl in eight days yeah and and i i truly I, i couldn't imagine being any yeah. yeah, you know that's why you're like you just want to do this podcast. I'm like, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and we can feel to it say. too, right? Yeah, like yeah. just the vibes that you give off, man. Yeah. Like, just being in the room with you, obviously. The energy you're lighting 12, up the room. Shot. You guys gonna go oh, start your a... own uh, comedy routine? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny, actually. We were just starting to do our own little comedy skit before you showed up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was like, uh, oh, I could do something about bubbles, and I was like, oh, I came from the car sales, and I'll be like, oh, classic sales guy. <laughs> <laughs> Greasy. I'll give you guys both notes. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Your balls. That was good. See. Plan B was your best yeah. line. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, if you um, goals for yourself, where do, you, where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Again, I, I really answer the question. I'm going to be the biggest comic in the entire world. Sure. And I, I, I always, believe you, man. Yeah, I always awesome. say to my my fiance, I, go, I look at her and I say, "Private jets." And then this actually, Jason Rose, who we just talked about, he said to me one time, "You're a great comic and you're you're a great businessman, and you need to start thinking private jets." And I go, "What do you mean by that?" He goes, "You need to think." In a way that if someone wants to book you to perform in their town, they have to send a private jet to get you there. Hmm. Think in that way. Mm-hmm. And maybe, hopefully, he goes, I hope for you. He's a pretty dark comic, but he's actually very profound and a really nice guy. Uh, he goes, I hope that you get private jets. But if you don't get private jets, you'll be flying in first class. So that's, I always say, like, sometimes Jana will be with me and I'll be at a god-awful gig in whatever town. And she likes to come with me sometimes. And they're introducing me and I could tell it's not going to go well. And actually the, the specific night I'm talking about ended up being great, but I looked at her and I went, private jets, baby, private jets. And then they went, please welcome Eric Johnson. Went, wow. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and uh, yeah, I, I just, I, I'm okay with exactly where uh, everything, everything happens for a reason, like I said, and, and I'm exactly where I want to be and I'm exactly where I need to be and I'm sure. exactly going where I want to go. Yeah, yeah. The thing about making it is that my definition of making it changes every single day. Mm-hmm. Right? Five years ago, my well, more than that, 10 years ago, my dream was to not have another job and just be a stand up comic. I haven't had another, I haven't, I stopped bartending seven years ago. I, I've been living my dream for seven years if I'm basing that on my 10 year dream ago. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I have the dreams of performing in sold out theaters. Like, my biggest dream is I want to sell out cops someday yeah. that's right. my that's my goal i go and people go why cops i go because i'm hamilton sure. i grew up in this town this yeah. town supports me i'll support them back you know yeah or when we went to the rally with the arc for the arkells and that big stage they did at tim hortons field i turned to my fiance and went, i want to do something i can just do a comedy show at tim hortons field i had those grand ideas guest host snl and whatever and hopefully someday we'll look at this exact clip and go he did that sure. and then he did that 
and that he did that. Sure. You know? And that's the whole reason we're going to have you back here in five to ten years. <laughs> yeah. We're going to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hopefully I'll you guys have a real studio. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is great. You, Gosh, would not, this you guys is... would never guess what's on the other side of these cameras. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we're all great dreams start. Mm-hmm. We're, actually, we're actually moving it into an old 70s Winnebago uh, for the next round. So yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah. 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 We're gonna go it's a shag and wig. <laughs> shag and <laughs> wig. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. I got some candy. Pick them up. Now, if anybody wanted to follow you, reach out to you. What's the best way? Eric Johnston, who? Across the board. Eric with a C, Johnston with a T, W H O. That's Love all my that. stuff. Instagram, TikTok, website, email. Sure. Uh, come to a show this summer. I don't know when you're launching these. Looks like right away. Yeah. Um, uh, the Eric Johnston Unstoppable Summer Comedy Tour is coming to a town near you this summer. I'm going to be in Beansville, Winona. I'm in Mississauga. I'm all over Ontario. Awesome. Uh, and yeah, going up north and going to Kenora and then driving back from there. So. I'm all over the road, and then I will see you guys down the road. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> when, awesome. does that, when does that? Uh, when does that start? By, by uh, I'll tell you right now. Hold on, June fourth, I believe. One sec. Talk amongst yourselves. Um, yeah. Great guy. <laughs> <laughs> keep going. Keep going. Yeah. It's so far back. I'm so glad. Uh, June fourth is the first gig, and it goes all the way till September sixteenth, where I end in Ridgeway, Ontario, awesome. at the Sanctuary Center for the Arts. Perfect. So we'll plug wow. maybe a link in the description for uh, if click on the ticket link below. Absolutely. Yeah. Or above. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you take a link somewhere. Here. He doesn't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, That's Eric, awesome. thank you so much for being a part of today's podcast. And to everyone who's listening, watching, if you like today's video, be sure to hit that like button. Don't forget to hit that subscribe. Hit the notification so you don't miss out on any future content. Thank you again for everybody for watching, and we'll catch you in the next one. See you guys. Woo. Good job.